All right, we're moving on to the next chapter in the Klein textbook, chapter 22. It's all about alpha carbon chemistry. So first, let's define what an alpha position is. The alpha position is usually in reference to some sort of carbonyl group. So I'll draw out a basic carbonyl group. And you can have alpha is the first carbon away from that carbonyl group. This is our alpha carbon. What do you think the next one is, one further out? Beta, gamma, and then delta. <coughs> Typically, when we're looking at uh, reactive species, we're looking at the alpha carbon. Does anybody know why? What's unique about alpha protons in particular? The resonance stabilized, right? If you pluck one of those protons off, you have a resonance stabilized conjugate base. That's not true of beta, gamma, or delta protons. So this makes them really unique. If you think about the pKa of a CH bond, a typical one, meaning not an alpha one, typically they fall in the 40 to 50 pKa range. So they're really, really crummy acids. The pKa of an alpha proton is typically around 20. It can vary depending on how much resonance stabilization is there. So for example, if you've got an alpha proton in between two carbonyl groups, those are even more acidic. But the general alpha proton pKa range is about 20. So you can imagine 20 orders of magnitude more acidic is a big deal. That means they can do reactions with strong bases. And there's a handful of strong bases that we'll cover in this chapter. But for right now, I'm going to just use generic base B. And I'm going to draw out alpha protons coming off right here. So in this example, we're just looking at acetone. And if we've got a strong base, it normally has a negative charge. This can quickly grab one of these alpha protons. I'm just going to erase the alpha right there. Clamp down and kick up electrons onto that oxygen. clean up my double bond there. And you can show both resonance structures if you want. So for example, you could kick electrons back down to that carbon and keep it as a carbonyl where you've got the lone pair on carbons right there. But if you think back to first term, which is the major resonance structure, the one on the left or the right, and why? left. Why? Yeah, oxygen's more electronegative. It's happier carrying that negative charge. So this would be our major contributor. And the one on the right is our minor contributor, but it's a very, very important minor contributor. We can do a lot of chemistry where we have the negative charge um, or partial negative on that carbon. This is referred to as an enolate. And it makes sense, right? If you've got an oxygen with a negative charge, you typically have an ATE suffix, but it also has double bond characters, so it's like an alkene, so enolate is kind of the hodgepodge of both of those terms together. You can also have the same reaction with strong acid, or similar reaction, I should say. I also forgot to include my conjugate acid up here, so I'll go ahead and plug that back in. And let's take a look at how the reaction with acid is different. What do you think the first step is going to be with strong acid? Yeah, protonation of the carbonyl. <laughs> Probably seeing a trend lately. So in your first step, you're going to protonate your carbonyl, and then you still have these alpha protons hanging out over here, right? So I'll show those alpha protons. And you've got your conjugate base from your original acid that's still floating around. So in this next step, you can grab one of those alpha protons, clamp down, and kick up electron density 
to that oxygen. Oops. And you regenerate your acid, meaning it's catalytic throughout this reaction mechanism. This isn't an enolate because it doesn't have a negatively charged oxygen. You can't use that ATE suffix. Instead, you just call this an enol. It's half alkene, half alcohol. Does that make sense? In both situations, though, it's interesting because, for example, you can move that lone pair down and kick it onto that oxygen, or sorry, that carbon on the far right-hand side, meaning both carbons have very strong partial negative character, meaning they can act as nucleophiles. And that's what we're going to see a lot in the, this chapter is carbon-based nucleophiles from enols and enolates. All right. So let's take a look at enol formation with catalytic base, too. And same sort of idea as the original one we saw with base, but with a slight spin on it. This time I'm just going to use something like hydroxide as my base. Just like before, we can kick up the electrons to that oxygen. And your catalytic acid in this example, because your base is hydroxide, is water. And so this can steal a proton back from that water And this, too, can give you your neutral alcohol and regenerate your hydroxide base. In either case, we are favoring formation of the enol. Now the question is, what's the difference between this reaction with catalytic base and the top one where we made the enolate? It really depends on the strength of your base, right? So if we look at the bottom one, in this step, Right here, we had water as our weak acid donor. However, if you started out with a really, really, really strong base, it's never going to give up that proton back, and you'll be stuck at the enolate. So you can form enols when you're using a catalytic base that isn't that strong, something like hydroxide. But if you're using a really, really strong base, like LDA, you're never going to get your enol. You'll always overshoot to your enolate. Does that make sense? All right. So let's talk a little bit about the equilibrium position. You've probably noticed I've been using equilibrium arrows pretty carefully here. And the equilibrium position is really important for these. So let's say I've got cyclohexanone and catalytic hydroxide. I'll just write catalytic underneath. Do you think we're going to be making an enolate or an enol? Yeah, an enol, right? Because hydroxide, yeah, it's a good base, but it's not a really, really, really strong base. It can actually give protons back. So we can think about this. We can draw the expected enol we'd get, where the double bond would move down, and we would regenerate hydroxide. Now the question is, does the equilibrium favor the starting material side or the product side on the right-hand side? In this situation, it favors the starting material side. So I'm just going to draw equilibrium arrows that are unbounced like this to show that the equilibrium favors the starting material side. And you can actually measure this using NMR, which is pretty cool. Does anybody know which peak you would look for in NMR? That would be really unique. Stand out like a sore thumb. Yeah. Where do alkene protons typically show up? It's usually around 5-ish. So these protons show up at 5 ppm. So you can actually integrate that proton relative to the starting material, and you can find the exact ratio of these. And what they found is that the starting material hangs out at around 99.99%. So really, this doesn't want to form very much of the enol. It very much wants to stay as the ketone. So let's take a look at another example. Let's 
time we'll still use hydroxide. It's going to be catalytic. And we're going to deprotonate the alpha protons. But now the question is, are we going to deprotonate the alpha protons in the middle or one of the ones on the outside in blue? What do you think? Middle. Why is that? Yeah, more resonance. Okay. So now let's think about what happens when we deprotonate one of those red alpha protons. It doesn't really matter which side you show the double bond at. So I just chose to show the double bond on the right-hand side, and now we've got our enol here, just like our enol up here. And just like before, we're going to regenerate our hydroxide. However, this time, if you do this experiment and you look at it with NMR, you've got 70 to 90 percent enol and only 10 to 30 percent of your starting material. So this one the products are more favored than the starting material. Does anybody know why besides resonance? I'll try to give you a hint with the way I drew my product. Yeah, hydrogen bonding. So if you look at this, it can actually hydrogen bond to itself and form an intramolecular hydrogen bond. Does that make sense? So it's really stable and happy that way. That, and it's highly conjugated, too. If you remember, conjugation is one of the driving stabilizing forces, and we've got alternating double single bonds here. So this is a pretty happy molecule. All right, let's look at the most extreme example now. And just like before, and use catalytic hydroxide. Some people will ask, can you grab beta protons off of this position, off the left-hand side? Not exactly, those are sp2. Typically when we're looking at alpha positions, we want it to be sp3. So what we're looking for are the alpha protons right here. And just like we saw before, you can grab this, clamp down, pick up electrons to that oxygen. And in this example, you actually don't reform your base. You just form water. And this reaction is essentially irreversible. It's like 99.99999% product. Why? It's aromatic, right? Aromatic stabilization basically means this absolutely does not want to go in the reverse direction because in order to do so, you'd break aromaticity. We know that's hugely unfavorable. Does that make sense? So in most examples, we'll see equilibrium position usually favors the starting material. However, sometimes it will favor the product side if you've got some uh, resonance occurring. In addition, if you're trying to form your enolate rather than your enol, you can just crank on it with really strong base and push the equilibrium that way. So base strength and resonance stabilization plays a huge role. All right, so let's look at reactivity. Yeah. Yeah, in this case, that wouldn't matter very much if you add more water in. Um, the biggest thing is the overall strength of your base, yeah, or the stability of your product, for that matter. So if your product's really stable and your base is really strong, it's going to favor the product side. If your product's not very stable and your base isn't very strong, it's not going to favor your product. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's look at the reactivity of enols and enolates. And... I'm first going to do an enolate. And just like we saw previously, you've got a resonance structure where you can delocalize the negative charge onto the upper oxygen. So this was our enolate. One of the more common reactions you can see 
is where you have some sort of electrophile, and I'll just draw this as a green E plus as an electrophile. And this carbon can attack your electrophile. resulting in the electrophile having a new bond to that carbon right there. Under other circumstances, you can have an electrophile where the oxygen attacks it. Oops. That means the double bond remains in this position, and now your electrophile is bonded to the oxygen, and you can make something like an ether. In the textbook, the majority of the examples we see are with carbon alkylation or carbon reactivity. You don't see much of the oxygen reactivity until later on in chemistry. So if you take advanced organic chemistry, you will see more of that. But it is important to remember that both sites are nucleophilic, right? They both have a lot of that partial negative character. All right, so like I said, this one is the more common one. In our textbook. The bottom one still can occur, but it requires the appropriate conditions. So let's review a little bit on selecting bases too, because base selectivity is really important for forming your original enolate. This is a throwback all the way to first term, but I figured it'd be a good review. <laughs> and let's take a look at some common situations. First one will be with acetone. And we've got alpha protons on acetone. And if you look up the pKa of acetone in a pKa table, it's 19.2. And let's say we want a base, right now it's just going to be an imaginary base, and we want to favor the formation of our enolate, meaning we don't really want it to be in equilibrium. The main thing you should be watching out for is this conjugate acid, right? Should the conjugate acid have a higher or lower pKa than 19.2? Think about it this way. What's more acidic, low pKa, high pKa? Low pKa is more acidic, right? So if this is a lower pKa, that means it's more acidic and would push the reaction in the opposite direction. That means in this case, you want a pKa that is much higher than 19.2. That way the reaction isn't reversible. Some people ask me how much higher. The general rule of thumb I used to follow was five units higher, because that means it's five orders of magnitude less acidic, right? That gives you a really safe comfort zone. So in general, I'd say approximately five units higher. Does that make sense? That's where pKa tables come in handy, is you can use that to find the corresponding pKa values. If you go back to the first term website, I gave you that list of common bases, their conjugate acids, and the uh, relevant pKa's for all of those. So you can also use that as a rough guide. Okay, so let's take a look at a second example. And we'll try to use a real base this time. Just like before, we said that the interior alpha protons are going to be way more acidic because they have more resonance stabilization. And in this situation, we want to form our enolate or we can even just say enol for this example. And then we've got to think about our conjugate acid and the appropriate base, right? So I'm just gonna write base up here. And then over here, I'm gonna write conjugate acid. 
Okay, and just like before, it's a really good idea to look up the pKa of your alpha protons. The pKa of these is approximately 9. So what do you think a really good, cheap base would be to accomplish this? Water. Water. Or hydroxide, right? Hydroxide would be the better one because water would be the conjugate acid. Does anybody remember the pKa of water? About 15. So pKa is about 14 to 15, depending on which table you look at. So you can see pretty clearly the conjugate acid is five pKa units higher. It's a cheap, readily available base. So that would be the base of choice for most of these types of reactions. It just really depends on the acidity of your alpha protons. All right, one more, then we'll move on. I wanted to show you the other most common base that you'll see. So again, we're going to use acetone. And just like before, I said the pKa of acetone, about 19.2. The other really common base that you'll see is this lithiate, or lithium salt, I should say. So there's a nitrogen with a negative charge, two isopropyl groups. Why do you think this is a really good base to choose? Super bulky. It's not going to accidentally attack into the carbonyl and kick up electrons, right? It's simply too bulky to do that. The only thing it really can do is pluck off protons. That makes it a really good base. So in this reaction, you can run this. Just like before, get your negative charge. Your conjugate acid, in this case, is going to be an amine. And the pKa of most amines is around 36 to 38. So you can tell this is really, really good as a base. It's way higher than five units. This is a common base called lithium diisopropyl amide. Most people don't like using that long name, so they just refer to this as LDA. The key with LDA, though, is it's a really, really big, bulky, strong base. That means it's awesome for forming enolates. It won't add in accidentally to the carbonyl. Make sense? All right. So now what we're going to do is start talking about other reactivity involving the alpha carbons. And if you remember, I said the more common attack is where the carbon acts as the nucleophile. So that's where we're going to begin. We're going to first look at alpha halogenation. First one we're going to look at is alpha halogenation under acidic conditions. So in this reaction, I'm just going to draw the overall reaction conditions. You need catalytic acid. So I'm just going to write H3O plus in brackets as our catalytic acid, and you need some sort of halogen source. Often this is bromine, but you can do other ones as well. When you do this, you can brominate your alpha position, and we'll go through the mechanism to practice this. Typically, this is an intermediate, and the reason why is you can further react this. Oops make a new alkene oh, oh man struggling with my double bonds today there we go that looks like this this is called an alpha beta unsaturated oh man come on <laughs> pull it together Joe unsaturated ketone and we're going to see a lot of these later on. What reagent do you think we need to do to accomplish that last step? Strong base, right? This looks a lot like E2 chemistry. So if you've got a strong 
non-nucleophilic base, you can simply do an E2 reaction and make an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone. And we'll cover these a lot. So now let's dive into the mechanism. Try to figure out why this is occurring for that first step. So like I said, we're going to show this with hydronium as our catalytic acid. Just like we're getting used to, you can protonate the carbonyl it's under equilibrium conditions. In the next step, we've got these alpha protons hanging off. The water can act as a weak base. Snag one of those alpha protons, clamp down, and kick up electron density. I'm actually going to curve this down so we have more room. But like I said, we do need to consider the resonance structure. And with this resonance structure, you can push electron density back down to that neighboring carbon. So now our alpha carbon has a negative charge. And we've also created our acid. So I'm just going to write H3O plus down on the bottom here. It's important to remember that that's hanging around. OK, in the next step, we're going to use our halogen. doesn't actually do anything until you form your enol. And this carbon can attack the halogen, in this case elemental bromine, and kick off bromide. Oops. Just forgot that proton on here. Excuse me. You still have elemental bromine and your hydronium ion. And then in your last step, you're going to remove that last proton. So I'll just write minus H plus. Typically water will be the thing to do that. The bromide anion is a really crummy base. And you'll be left with your desired alpha halogenated product. The other important thing to remember is if you keep on pushing this, you can actually over halogenate and add in one or more than one bromine off of that alpha carbon. Typically, that's not the desired goal, but occasionally you might see that where you purposely want to overdo it. All right. So now let's consider a problem. And I want you to discuss this with your neighbor and see if you can agree. So in this problem, we're going to use a really similar starting material. So we're going to react this with catalytic acid, elemental bromine, now the question is, what product or products will you get if you get more than one, will there be a major product? I'll give you a second to think about this, but talk about it with your neighbor and see if you agree. Okay. Yep. <laughs> okay, so let's get started with the mechanism 
really quick, and then I'll let you think about it some more. So in our first step, we know we can protonate the carbonyl. You've got two different types of alpha protons, and I've got them drawn in as blue alpha protons on the left and a green alpha proton on the right. So for example, if I'm going to go after the blue, I can say, hey, let's clamp down here and kick up electrons. If that's the case, we would be going on this left-hand pathway. And we would get this enol. Let's do the green one as well and then compare. Could follow the green pathway. Get the double bond on the opposite side. All right, which of these pathways do you think is more likely? The right. The right one, why? Well, it's double bond, it's the right, the right side is more stable. Why is it more stable? Substituted. Yeah, it's more substituted, right? So if we look at the alkene and we think about alkene stability, we know more substituted alkenes are more stable. That means the one on the right is the more stable intermediate. Okay, so that means it's probably going to be favorable going through that reaction pathway on the right rather than the one on the left. And if we think about this, I'm just going to skip ahead and draw two arrows, save some time. But in either case, you can do halogenation. For the one on the left, the nucleophilic carbon is in red right there, right? Because that's where the partial negative is. Or the one on the right, it's on the right like that. So assuming we don't over halogenate, we could potentially get two different products. We could get one where we get a bromine coming off the left hand side. And we could get one where you get the bromine off, whoops, that should be a double bond, excuse me. And you could get one where it's coming off the right hand side. But like I said, the pathway that goes through the more stable intermediate is going to give you the major product. And this one will be your minor product. It's one good thing about third term organic chemistry is all these trends we've been learning all year show up again and again and again and again. And you can almost start to infer which product is going to be more likely. All right, so let's take a look at the simple reaction under basic conditions. This one's pretty easy. And typically you can do this just with hydroxide, even though we know the equilibrium is not favored. And for this example, I'm only going to have one set of alpha protons. Just like I said, anytime you use hydroxide, it's not a really, really strong base. That means it's going to favor the enol and not the enolate. I'm going to go ahead and draw the enol. Looks like this. And then in the next step, just like we saw previously, you can throw in your elemental bromine. One player pair will clamp down. This carbon will attack and kick off the bromine like that. Almost there. Last but not least, the hydroxide or a base. Actually, I'm just going to write minus H plus. You can get your alpha halogenation using a base. So most of the reactions that we see involving enols or enolates have some sort of reactivity under acidic and basic mechanisms, as long as it's an enol that you're using. Make sense? All right, we've got a few more reactions. The first one is alpha bromination of carboxylic acids. And 
and this one might be useful for your pod. Hint, hint. <laughs> the other name for this, too, if you want to get super fancy and sound cool in a chemistry meeting, is the Hell-Volhard-Zelinsky reaction. Because they didn't give one person all the credit. All right, the mechanism I'm going to show you is a bit condensed. It's not going to include all of the nitty gritty details, which you might appreciate. But you always need a carboxylic acid for this reaction. And then the first step is to react it with PBr3. What do you think that's going to do? It's going to, going to change the alcohol to what? A bromine, right? So just like we saw in the acid halide chapter, you can convert carboxylic acids to acid halides with thionyl chloride. That also did the same thing with alcohols. This will do the same thing, but make an acid bromide. Acid bromides are crazy reactive. They're not super common. However, you can work with them. And in the next step, what we're going to do is we're going to react this with strong acid. Yep. So this is an acid halide. They still call it an acid even though it has a halogen there. Yeah. So in the next step, what we're going to do is react this with strong acid, and we're going to try to form our enol. And we still have our bromine coming off right there. And in the next step, what we're going to do is we're going to react this with our elemental bromine. And just like we saw previously, this pi bond can kick down, grab the bromine here, eject off bromide. is not a super happy looking molecule. <laughs> so let's try to get it neutral. We'll pluck off a proton just showing minus H plus. Still mighty unhappy looking. Acid halides don't like having bromines coming off of them. They don't really even like chlorines for that matter. So to get rid of that bromine and change it back to a carboxylic acid, all you're going to do is nucleophilic acyl substitution, but you need a really weak nucleophile, something that's not going to do chemistry with this bromine that we just installed, but it'll pop off the bromine on the acid halide. Oops, sorry. And you can go back to your carboxylic acid and this R group like that, or sorry, BR. So that's the hell volhard zelinsky reaction. Make sense? I think that's the one I had on the pot. I'd have to double check again. Looks similar? All right. I think what we'll do is pause there. There's another reaction I was hoping to get to, but I don't think we'll have enough time. But what I would do is try to take a look at that pod and get started um, in class today. That way, if you have questions, you can ask me.